I was in Spain earlier this year, and I was shocked. There are percentage-wise five times the percentage of Muslims in Spain as in America, percentage-wise, five times. Um, in other words, Spain is like 5%, 6% Muslim, right? We are one or less than 1%. By the way, America is less than 1% Muslim. Do the math. 370 million, 7 million. It's like literally you know, less than 1%. Spain, 1 in 0.5 if you want to be max. Spain has 5 to 6% Muslims, right? Can anybody guess with a 6% Muslim population in the entire country of Spain? And it's Spain is a secular democracy. Spain is the land of also freedom and whatnot. Can anybody guess how many purpose-built messages exist in Spain? Give me an idea. Just guess. 10? 30? 1,000? These will all be good guests. Five. Five. Five purpose-built mosques in all of Spain. One of them needed government approval, sorry, government intervention from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia in the 80s, the Granada Mosque in front of Al-Hamra. The rest of the country, with great difficulty, four mosques were built here and there, purpose-built. The rest of, of the musallas are basements. People's houses become Jumu'ah. Rented facilities that from the outside looks like a shop, and then for Jumu'ah it becomes a place of Jumu'ah. Now I asked the, the Spanish people, hold on, the Spanish Muslims, hold on a sec. The constitution doesn't forbid building mosques. They said, yes, but every time you apply, the government finds some loophole. Oh, traffic problem. Oh, this, oh, that. And they shut it down over and over and over again. And there is no appeal. It's not like America. You can't take the government to court. This is in Spain. Europe is not that different. Again, Norway, Sweden. I did a tour of those lands. Again, shocking statistics. Norway and Sweden are almost 10% Muslim. Oslo, Oslo, I should say. Sweden's cap uh, Norway's capital. Oslo is 10% Muslim. Stockholm is also close to 10% Muslim. A small city down south, Malmo, that I visited... They project that within a decade or two, it will be 30% Muslim. 30% Malmo, because a lot of re refugees came there. There's barely one purpose-built mosque in Malmo. I think two in, in, in Stockholm. You know, one or two in, in, in Oslo. The rest are all these converted places. And for other factors as well. Whereas here in America... Every minute, a new project is conceived in some state. A new masjid is going to be built. A new school for the community. Every single city, wherever you travel to, there are projects going on right now. It's literally like a cascade of dominoes across this country. And not just that, but a major, major incentive, perk that we have, an opportunity that we have, is that we are being given our dreams to conceive on a blank canvas. Why? Because we are the first generation over here to come of age and to be able to do this. If you look at European Islam, because the first generation were migrant workers, now the third generation, because they came in the 40s and 50s, the third generation that now has the wealth to construct and to build, they are hampered by their own fathers and grandfathers about the vision, about the conception, about the sectarianism, about the narrow-mindedness. In an average street in UK, in the Muslim suburbs and areas, there's probably three, four, five messages within walking distance. Each one doesn't pray behind the other. And so when they envision something bigger, it's only for that specific slither within their strand of Islam. Whereas over here, we come together as diverse people, diverse ethnicity, diverse backgrounds, and we want to build the best Islamic school for our children collectively. We want to build a masjid that has a gymnasium. We want to build that has a community center, a life center. We are given a blank slate. 
No other country in the world has the freedoms and the lack of internal and external bureaucracy. Understand this point. There is external bureaucracy, the government, and there's internal bureaucracy, the elders. We don't have that. We have a complete open uh, slate to draw whatever we want to draw, envision whatever we want to envision. The sky is the proverbial limit. The opportunities we have here are second to none. We are building institutions of higher learning. I am the dean of the Islamic Seminary of America. And of course, I'm biased towards my seminary. But I dare say, and there are some students here that have taken our classes, I know this. I dare say there is not an institute in the entire world that teaches the way that we are teaching, integrating the classical tradition with the modern academic study of Islam, intertwining Al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah with the latest research projects at Harvard, Yale, and MIT and Princeton. I dare say I can't think of any university that's doing what we are doing at the Islamic Seminary of America. And again, nobody's stopping us. I, I, I swear to you, and I have studied at these places, if we dare do this in the Middle East, we would be hereticized and banned overnight by internal sectarian policies. The scholars themselves would have deemed this heresy. How dare you read a book written by a non-Muslim about the Quran? So we are producing thought leaders that are unique in the entire world. And I say as somebody who has lived in the Middle East and lived around the world and traveled around the world, it is very likely that a renaissance of true, genuine, modern Islamic thought is going to come from this land. Already as it is, a slither of American preachers and teachers, and Allah has tested me to be amongst them. We are listened to by a global audience. You know, I was, personal anecdote, I was genuinely surprised a decade ago when Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, when they first had their... Um, analytics uh, to see where your followers were from and everything, right? This is a decade ago. Uh, and at the time, I, you know, this is a decade. It was a long time ago. Now things have progressed much more. At the time, my first time I came out, I just did a survey or a click where most of my viewers and, and followers from. This is, again, 2013, 2014. And I was genuinely shocked to discover, obviously, my largest demographics, obviously, is America, which I totally understood. My second largest at the time and this is 10 years ago, was in a country I had never visited up until that point in time. Can anybody guess which one? Just to guess. Um, Malaysia. Who said Malaysia? How did you guess Malaysia? Are you from Malaysia? So how did you guess Malaysia? <laughs> I had never been to Kuala Lumpur. Now I've been four times. I'm actually going next month to Kuala Lumpur. Now I go regularly. Once I found I got a large group of people, I might as well go and visit them, right? I had never been to Malaysia, and I was shocked. My largest group is in Malaysia. The third largest after Malaysia, can anybody guess? No, not Turkey, because English is an issue. As you know, you know, nope, quantity-wise, no. Nope. No, that's in the top 10, but no. Again, shock to me. Dhaka, Bangladesh. And I have yet to visit Dhaka, Bangladesh. And in that list as well was Karachi, Pakistan, which was shocked to me because I'm from Karachi, but I'm not speaking to them in Urdu. And this humbled me. Like, how come I have millions of people watching me in these countries that I've never visited? And so I decided I need to go visit what's going on. And when I went there to Pakistan, now I go every two, three years to Pakistan and Indonesia, I mean, Malaysia, I go every single year. Indonesia, I have been on a private visit, but not a uh, public one. The government and the muftis have invited me, but I just stalled it for the time. Inshallah, one day I'll go, but I only went on a private tour. I'm a scuba diver, so I went to Bali and I went to the Komodo Islands to go scuba diving in Indonesia, but uh, I didn't go to a public tour yet. Um, so I went to Pakistan. And subhanAllah, I spoke to the people there like, why are you guys, I literally asked a group of people, why are you guys listening to me? You have, mashallah, I mean, a dime a dozen. And they said what I thought they would say. The way you interpret and speak about Islam, it appeals to our intellect. These are all, as they call, upper class or whatever you want to call them. I, don't, I mean, just being, I don't want to sound elitist, but there is a reality that you also have to face. The educated class, by and large, 
I'm just being factual here. They are disconnected from their own clergy. And they find comfort in the religious rhetoric coming from the Western world. This is a tangible reality. Somebody has to do sociological surveys and I don't know what else. I mean, somebody's got to do that. But that is a reality that when I go to these lands and I'm speaking in English in Pakistan and my events are sold out, thousands of people come and they're wanting to listen to me in English. And these are the types of people that are generally, you know, the top 10% or 2% even of, of those lands. It's a very interesting phenomenon. So what does this show? It's not, the talk is not about me today. It's about American Muslims. What does it show? Our opportunities. If someone like me single-handedly, unintentionally can do this, well then what if a bunch of you, the top minds of this country, were to come together and to actually plan and to actually envision how can we influence the rest of the world? Listen, guys, brutally honest, America is a superpower. And you being in the superpower makes you a superpower. That's just the way the world works. We are number one in this world in terms of influence and whatever else you want to call it. We are the biggest superpower the world has ever seen in its history. And therefore, you being within that superpower gives you superpower strengths. It gives you a privilege that, frankly, we don't even understand and take advantage of. And I'm still coming to terms with this reality. Our potential is unmatched. We can lead a global renaissance of how we can live in the modern world, of rethinking through even classical questions like sectarianism. So our opportunities are second to none. Let's move on to threats before we open the floor for Q&A. Our threats are also many. And by and large, I don't think they're unique to America. So here's the point. Our weaknesses and threats are universal. Whereas our strengths and opportunities are by and large unique to us. That's the point I want to stress over and over again. Our threats. We have internal threats and external threats. Internal threats, existential. We are losing too many of our next generation. We have a high attrition rate. And this is a phenomenon that is of this generation, not mine. I grew up in the 80s. I don't know of a single person in my batch that left the faith. For some weird reason, even though we were so small, even though all of Houston, the Sunday school that I attended, my father started, it was probably 15 kids, 20 kids, right? For some weird reason, Islam and Iman was strong in our hearts. Whereas now, when the number of people is in the millions, our attrition rate is much higher. And we all know of people who have left Islam. That's an existential threat. Another existential threat is not the leaving of Islam, but the deformation of Islam. Because this is a very difficult question, and that's one of the questions I'm extremely interested in, and I'm very, very involved in. What does it mean to be a Muslim in the modern world? What aspects of the tradition are absolutely beyond change, immutable? And what aspects can be completely thought through? And what aspects can be fine-tuned? That is a very, very difficult question. Does not have an easy answer. And there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And there is a lot of back and forth going on here. But that is an existential threat. Because some other faith traditions have changed so much to adapt to the circumstance that there's very little left of the faith. And they are almost irrecognizable as a separate faith entity. I don't want to be too specific, but think about it and get the point. So we have to be careful about acquiescing to popular culture too much because that means we've lost our identity. But what is that fine line? This is a question that involves theology. It involves law. It involves hermeneutics. You know, the sciences of fiqh and usul and aqidah, all of these sciences, and that's Personally, that's one of the biggest questions that troubles me. I go to sleep at night thinking about specific aspects along these lines here. And many of my talks, many of my Q&As, they deal with this reality if you listen to them. The reality of practicing Islam in the modern Western hemisphere. So that is definitely a threat internally. Externally, 
we also have a major threat. And we're seeing that threat right now. And we saw it. I think I'm speaking to a group. Most of you are too young to remember 9-11. You might have been born before, but not. But to remember a world pre-9-11 and post-9-11. I think most of you are too young for that. I was in my 20s when 9-11 happened. I gave khutbas and durus pre-9-11. That is an America long gone. The America pre-9-11, it's the America of dreams. The, the freedoms that we had, but also the naivety, because what 9-11 did for us as the American Muslim community, and I've spoken about this in other lectures, and I was an adult at the time, I fully remember and I'm cognizant of that. 9-11 to us was like a, a, a punch in the gut. Literally took our breath away. Complete surprise, complete shock, and how our government reacted, and the shutting down of so many institutions, the deportation of hundreds of scholars, the jailings that took place as well of people for the smallest infraction, students who overstayed their visas were locked up for years sometimes. And then, of course, the horrors of Guantanamo and all that's a whole separate category altogether. But the Patriot Act and how quickly. Americans were willing to give up their freedoms out of fear of the other, and the other was us. I remember vividly, clearly, all of these airport securities did not exist at all. When I would fly back then, you would walk with your family all the way to the gate to say goodbye to them, and not a single person stopped and checked you. And America and Canada, the border, oh my God. Students would regularly go without even passports because nobody cared and nobody checked. The whole world has radically changed and Americans are willing to give up their own freedoms because their governments have created this enemy called the Muslims and whatnot. And we see this over and over again. We see this right now. Congress has passed a bill defining, redefining anti-Semitism, which would include criticism of Israel. It would include calls for BDS. If this bill gets passed in the Senate and the president signs it into law, we are heading towards European versions of semi-fascist realities. I am doubtful it will get there, but this is a threat. And while, while we thank Allah that whatever happened after 9-11 to the American Muslim community, it didn't... It didn't, it didn't pose an existential threat. Let us also be realistic and understand what happened to Japanese Americans is one generation away. The paranoia that people have when they're terrified, the irrationality that exists in people who are scared, you cannot negotiate with them. And the people that were thrown in internment camps post-World War II, they're still alive right now. This is not generations ago. Post-World War II, when the Pearl Harbor event happened, America lost its marbles. The Supreme Court ratified the decision to round up anybody who had one-fourth Japanese ancestry. The police would come. Your neighbors would rat you out. The police would come, take you in the middle of the night, and throw you in an open-air prison for three years. Your children, you, yes, you were fed like prisoners, you were, you, but you couldn't do anything. No work, no nothing. You are in jail. And the intern ca uh, internment camps are still around to see. And the people that went through it, listen to their interviews, they're still alive in their 70s now. The apology only came in the 80s with Ronald Reagan. Sorry, we messed up. Well, too late. Millions of people thrown in. Now, I'm not trying to terrify you because it would be really difficult to have internment camps for Muslims because we're ethnically so different, right? But, but it did happen. And God knows what the future holds if population loses its realities again already like we see here again look at look at the modern context of how callous the broader public and our own politicians are about the genocide in Gaza how utterly inhumane I mean if the situation were reversed just imagine just imagine if an Arab land had taken two million people of a Jewish background thrown them in an open-air prison for 70 years. Just imagine if 35,000 women and children had been bombed by Arabs to those people. Just imagine if checkpoints had been set up. Just imagine the sheer depravity taking place. Could you think anybody would justify it in this country? But we see here 
the most powerful players, the most influential, the owners of social media platforms, without mentioning names here, right? The most powerful newspapers, constantly the lies against the oppressed people. They're literally creating a false image where the oppressors become the oppressed. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. If they can do that for a land far away, what do you think they can do over here? So without a doubt, there is a threat. And that threat means we need to stand up and fight for our rights, as every minority has done in this land, as every single faith tradition and every ethnicity has done. And so there are many threats, I'm not going to deny that. And one aspect that I have to mention, I kind of alluded to it, in many ways, American Muslims are the strongest out of all Western Muslims, but in one way they are the weakest, and that is our percentages. Every other Western Muslim, uh, Western Muslim community, yes, every other Western Muslim community is exponentially more than us. Canada is 6% Muslim. Mississauga, I was in Mississauga two weekends ago, Mississauga is 15% Muslim. Go think about that. London, UK is 10% Muslim. Oslo, 10%. Vienna, Austria, Vienna, 10% Muslim. Stockholm, roughly 10% Muslim. France, Paris, probably 15%, if not 20 or 25%. Statistics are amazing. Their problem is they do nothing. They're apolitical. Their problem is they're completely disconnected from the system. If only they tapped in, they could change. But that's their problem. Can you imagine if we had that? But we don't. Don't be fooled by living in Boston or Chicago or Houston where we are concentrated. Yes, in these cities, mashallah. But the rest of America, we have 370 million people. And the most American cities and municipalities have very small percentages of Muslims. So put together, we are probably one point something percent, very small. And that is an existential threat. And what makes it worse, the broader population thinks we're like 20% because they've been made to fear us, you know, like, oh my God, they're everywhere, they're everywhere. In reality, we're nothing. And this is definitely a major problem. Nonetheless, I want to conclude on a positive note, and that is the tide is changing. I mean, look around you. SubhanAllah, I was at the protest, you know, at, at Harvard and at MIT over here today. Look around you and see the majority of people protesting have nothing to do with our faith. They've understood this is a humanitarian cause. It's a cause that transcends a religion. It's a cause of oppressor versus oppressed. It's a cause of blatant genocide. And in my humble opinion, even if Israel has won the battle, they've lost the war without a doubt. They've lost the war. Globally, they've lost the war. We are the only country left that is blindly supporting them. And that's something we need to think about and why that is the case. And Because no European country, even though they're tacitly following, but no European country is sticking its neck out for Israel. It's only our country. And therefore, once this country changes its mind, and the people have already changed their minds, it's only a matter of time before it translates up there. Once this country officially changes its position, Israel will not have a leg to stand on the international community. And they're going to have to rethink through or... Some other change has to take place here. But the future is indeed bright. And I want to conclude before I open the floor for Q&A by finishing the anecdote I began with my father coming here in 1962 to give the first Eid khutbah with a grand total of how many people, guys? Three people. So Allah blessed me to be born and raised in that city of Houston. I went to engineering at the University of Houston. I did work at Dow Chemical for a while. Uh, I, by the way, in the early 90s, you guys don't even remember this, you don't even know this probably. Uh, there's a language called Fortran. Have you heard of that language? You know Fortran? Two people in the audience know Fortran, okay? So three people, sorry, okay. So in the 90s, Fortran was the language of, of engineering. So I got hired at Dow Chemical uh, to write a computer program to synthesize polymer reactions uh, before you, you do them in the lab. So you put in an input about what, you know, the polymers you're going to have, and the program is going to synthesize, you know, the output. So I wrote, like, 
three, 4,000, you know, lines of code. My God, I hate writing code. I don't know how anybody does it. But anyway, uh, so I know I, I feel the pain of those computer programmers. So I spent an entire summer with not doing that. And that's when I realized I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. <laughs> I had a spiritual epiphany. I'm like, sorry, I don't want to be painful. Okay, it's like, that's when I realized you can pay me as much as you want. <laughs> I have, I, I, I don't want to, this personally. So okay, it's like, so that's when I decided to go to Medina. You know, I was like, okay, I, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to do something. And I was going through a spiritual, this was the 90s. Guys, there was no English speaking alim in the Western world. Nobody that was a true bona fide alim that spoke English as a mother language. You know, so I was a different world in time. I'm, I'm that old guy. So I, there was nobody back then. So I'm like, I want to study my faith. I don't know what my religion is. I, I, I'm completely jahil and I, whatnot. So I, you know, left my degree at Dow Chemical, left my, sorry, I left my job at Dow Chemical. And I went to pursue Islamic studies, spent 10 years over there. 9-11 happened. And I decided that was another epiphany. Like I need to come back. I need to, you know, preach to my people and build bridges and whatnot. And so I decided to come back here. And I came back to Houston. I got accepted to Yale. So I was in Houston for a few months before starting my, my PhD at Yale. And uh, the Islamic Society of Greater Houston invited me to give the khutbah for Eid in 2005. And so they hired the George R. Brown Convention Center because that's how they did Eid over there. And I gave Eid in Houston, and my father was sitting in front of me, and I mentioned in that khutbah that 45 years ago, my father came to this land as one of the first Muslims, and he gave the first Eid khutbah with a grand total of three people. And in his wildest dreams, he could never have conceived. In his most grandiose imagination, he never even thought of the fact that his own son, born and raised in Houston, would go and study Islam overseas and come back trained as a cleric and a sheikh and an alim and give khutbah as a trained imam to not three, but now 30,000 Muslims in the George R. Brown Convention Center. This is the progress of one generation. One generation. This is what America gives you. In one generation, from where to where. So I ask you now, what do you think is going to happen for the next generation? How much do you think we can rise and build for the next generation? That's where I'm asking you to conceive, to imagine, to literally, you have a blank slate. Imagine the most grandiose project that you can. If this could happen without planning, because it happened without planning, what can happen when concerted minds come together and actually plan? So be brave, be ambitious, and think about how you can contribute to the ummah. And all of us have different fields. All of us have different specialities. All of us have different talents. But our vision and our goal is one. And that is to achieve the pleasure of Allah and to preserve the legacy, to preserve the, the beautiful deen and religion that we have and to make sure not only our progeny appreciates it, but the broader public around us is aware of it. They're not scared of it. They're not demonizing us. There's so many projects to do. So my advice to all of you, thank Allah for where you are. Thank Allah for the opportunities and strengths that you have and work together to overcome the weaknesses and to make sure those threats never materialize. I want to conclude on a point I've been saying for the last year or two in almost every talk of this nature. We are at a pivotal time in American Islam. At a pivotal time. Seminal time. Why? Because we are the only generation that is fully in tune with our heritage and also fully Americanized. There's only going to be one generation like us. We are the only generation, most of us in this room, we are comfortable in our ethnic backgrounds and we're very comfortable in our American identity. That was not the case when my father came here in the 60s, right? He was struggling to speak English, right? This is all of our parents when they came like this. That has long gone. But our children are going to have hardly anything of our ethnicity and heritage. That's also a reality. We are that one generation that will quite literally decide the future. So what we do in the next 30 years is going to dictate the future of Islam for the next 300 years. What we do for the next 30, our vision, our planning, our conception, our dreaming, 
it's literally going to dictate the future of Islam in this country and maybe even the Western world and maybe even influence the Eastern world, which is already doing for the next few centuries. So Allah has chosen you to be at a unique time and unique place. Stand up to that challenge and make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy for what you're able to do and leave a legacy that will make you proud in this dunya and in the akhirah. فيا ذلي ويا خجلي إذا ما قال لي ربي أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود 